This is episode 17 of the Growth Tigers podcast. Before we begin today, I want to let you know that this episode is supported by Circo Coworking Space. This podcast is for the benefit of the community, so I'll only share things that I think are supportive. Circo is one of those beneficial things, not just a co-working space. Circo has one of the longest standing startup communities in Ho Chi Minh City at its heart, Viet Youth Entrepreneurs. Their mission is to create a home where creative and innovative individuals can thrive. It is a network designed to help nurture founders, startups, and growth-minded individuals. So if you're looking for a place that you can afford and has an incredible mix of experts, innovators, and dedicated founders, you need to check out Circo. Find out more details and sign up for their newsletter at circo.co, C-I-R-C-O dot C-O. Now, on to the show. Okay, everyone, welcome to the Growth Tigers podcast. My name is Brian Cotter, and I'm the host. I'm here to bring stories of entrepreneurs in Vietnam to you, wherever you may be. Today, we're sitting with Peter Pham. We're sitting here in Vietnam, and we're going to talk about his story, how he got here, and what exactly Phoenix Capital Group is, and what they're doing, because it seems like quite a lot. So thanks to Peter for joining us. Thanks, Brian. Good to be here. Okay, so Peter, you're uh, from Canada, is that right? Yes, I was uh, born in Canada, Mm -hmm. and my parents are Vietnamese, so about in the late 2000s, when... The market was really interesting about 2006, 2007. I decided to understand a little bit more about my background and history. And I also noticed that that was an interesting time in which uh, Vietnam was the second best performing stock market. So I decided to come here for better or for worse. Okay. So your field is investment management um, or is there something more specific? Okay. So Phoenix Capital Group, that's a great question. What we specialize in is what uh, Buckminster Fuller would refer to as a phenomenon in life, which is to try to be anti-entropic, which means to try to put order into chaos. And what I mean by that is basically one of our core strengths is analytics and a quantitative approach to various different facets and industries. So we have a a finance team, we do equity research, and we also do marketing, and we also do business intelligence. And the, the one single thread that holds everything together is the understanding of how to build models in overall chaotic systems. So if you're investing in the stock market, what model and approach can you implement that is extremely rational uh, and does not accentuate any cognitive biases in order to identify great opportunities? If you're doing marketing, are you doing traditional marketing, which is billboards where you cannot quantify the approach, or are you going to do digital marketing where you're able to do things like A-B tests? where you're able to determine uh, the customer acquisition costs and gradually refine the process to gr- build a great sales funnel. If you're doing business analytics, how are you looking at the inefficiencies to that business? What systems can you implement and how can you help directors of those businesses identify value within their bottom line or their margins? Okay, so it sounds like it's, it's pretty heavy in terms of systems and mathematics and these, these, these very advanced things, right? I, I think that overall, I mean, that is the, the history of man. And when you look at the success of Asia as a region, for example, we take a look at one of the first big revolutions, which was the agricultural revolution. So man was able to take a look at the, the geographical layout of an environment and be able to create a system, which is agriculture for himself in order to create the agricultural revolution. Secondly, we had a manufacturing revolution, which allowed individuals to scale power and strength, right? 
And then we also now have an information revolution, which is allowing us to scale our minds. So it's actually very natural of human beings to try to bring order into chaos and then to try to put that into a business model, uh, which is something that we do and which is definitely being concurred by big trends such as like uh, big data analytics, such as in professional sports, uh, quantitative analytics, such as the digital marketing revolution that's happening. So all of this is coinciding and it's, it's actually confirming this philosophical approach that we have towards doing business in both Vietnam or any market that we so desire. So m many people see Vietnam as quite chaotic in terms mm -hmm. of industry and market. And what journey have you taken to bring you to this point where you can apply and build these systems into any market you so desire? What, what did you learn? What have you had in terms of successes and failures that brought you to this point? Okay. So in term, from a strategic standpoint, I like to um, reference uh, Josh Waitskin. He is a world champion uh, chess player. He was the motivation for the movie uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. And uh, one of the interesting books I wrote, which is called The Art of Learning, he discusses about thinking about the end game. Okay, so if you're doing business in any shape or form, what you need to envision is that exit, that term sheet, for example. And what would the various terms within that term sheet look like, you know, when you're selling your equity in your business. And ultimately, what do you need to do to get there? So you just mentioned that Vietnam is a very chaotic environment. And I know that you talk a lot about having foreigners come in to Vietnam and trying to do business and how basically if they can offer that competitive advantage, that it would be a very viable environment to do so. So when you think about Vietnam, Vietnam would fit into one of those markets where you would have um, a lot of millionaires, maybe potential billionaires that are would be segmented into what you would call like bad millionaires and billionaires because most of their success is due to their different relationships uh, due to the economic structure of Vietnam. So if you're going to come in as a new player without, say, those relationships, how can you build a competitive advantage And are you envisioning the end game? And are you able to backwardize that end game to your current starting point? So what we notice in Vietnam is statistics actually only recently has actually become like a major. And maybe only recently could you get your um, master's thesis on it. Um, very few people are prominent when it comes to statistics, which is actually surprising because it's a very common thing that you would see um, the world over. But in Vietnam, it's still relatively new. So if you're going to find that competitive advantage, you've got to identify where various different weak points exist and you've got to emphasize those to build your own kind of like moat. And so back to, to your personal journey. Yeah. Um, what, so what was the journey? Where did you start? What was your first job? Okay. My, my major, how about that? Because that's even more important than your first job. My major was in information systems and human behavior. Okay. Multidisciplinary study, um, which works out very nice because you're able to extrapolate concepts and ideas. It mixes some social sciences with basically uh, IT. Now, during that period of time, we had, uh, we've witnessed basically two financial crises, right? Basically in the 2000s and 2007. And then the, the question was like, you know, why are stocks going down? So my journey then was like, how do I understand stock market behavior with my background? So it's not going to be from a finance perspective. It's going to be how do you analyze stocks using a quantitative approach? How can you write a program so that allows you, you to analyze that? So you approached finance and stocks first from the systems and behavioral side. Correct. Correct. Finance. Exactly. Okay. And the, the interesting thing is part of that is you're also learning some of the social sciences. Mm -hmm. The the thing about social sciences is that they're not very binary. There's many different schools of thoughts in terms of economics, in terms of psychology, in terms of philosophy, in terms of even business. How do you approach these things? And then since these are all arts, how do you implement a model that can allow you to be successful? And I, I think that encapsulates, say, like maybe a decade journey of going, 
So what are the better business people doing? What are the better investors doing? What are the better economists doing? And all of those are all interconnected because ultimately an individual, or in my case, say I was doing a business, that's on a very micro level. But by you playing the micro game, which is what I've been doing, say, for the last, say, decade or 15 years, then you also need to understand the macro game. And you can go forwards and backwards, understanding the macro and the micro. So basically, that's part of this journey, or at least the the methodical way to think about it. And I think that's what I want to emphasize for the audience. And I know that you're going to, this, this is going to be a conversation and maybe we're talking about providing advice. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing is if you think about it, some of the best advice is the, you're having basically a conversation with yourself in the past, right? This is how I would talk to myself if it was about 15 years ago. Hey, Peter, you know, think about like building systems, think about models. So you talk about what, what are the better economists doing? What are the better businesses doing? What are the most successful traders doing? Right. And um, then kind of building systems from that. Correct. So do you think there's a, a confirmation bias where you don't include the failures and saying what have they not been doing? A lot can be learned from the principles of game theory, right? And basically thinking about every move that you make in business, in, in life, as some kind of like tree diagram and observing the various different permutations and probabilities when you're developing that kind of strategy. So there's going to be a lot of unpredictable events that happen as you go through the course of your entrepreneurial career. It's just the kind of choices that you're going to make based on the options that you have available or maybe unavailable to you that will determine what would ultimately be success or failure. I don't think I've envisioned like to be sitting here with you today. I never plan for that, but there were certain things and elements that put us here today based on many things that we've done in our past. And that's why we somehow have created this serendipity. Let's talk about Phoenix Capital a little bit. Sure. Uh, it was founded in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. We use a lot of the key core principles, which I've kind of discussed about. And what we wanted to do was also utilize things like the internet to compete with uh, brick and mortar institutions from the perspective of financial services. So as you know, uh, many big banks require, um, you know, large buildings to indicate that. You also need to understand that if the end objective is also to create a lot of value and to, to obtain a lot of wealth as part of the process is where is the money flowing? Right. And basically, if you're not somehow in some shape or form connected uh, to financial services, which have been the ultimate benefactor of all this monetary easing post, say, 2007, 2008, then effectively, maybe you're going to be a bystander of that. Uh, money is almost like a hot potato game. And the, the last guy that's going to hold up, get, get the potato is going to be kind of like the loser. It's going to be the guys that are the closest to the central banks that are going to be the benefactors of that. So if you're in financial services, that inherently puts you closer to where all this quantitative easing is occurring. So the, the main foundation of the business was a focus on financial services and then how to help other financial institutions and then how to help enterprises, for example, enter Vietnam successfully. Uh, as there's been very few case examples of successful foreign investment into Vietnam. What we try to do is hopefully try to identify a successful business model that is anti-fragile to various different um, major macro or economic policies uh, from a government or centrally planned government that sets out an economic plan every five years. Can you... Um Tell us exactly what you mean by anti-fragile. I mean, I, I think I know where you're going, but maybe some of the listeners don't. Yeah, so anti-fragility is, um, well, the opposite of anti-fragility is fragile. And what we've seen is if you develop a business that is almost impervious to maybe external factors, from affecting, say, its profitability, that would be extremely compelling. And if the business actually becomes stronger 
based on all this chaos, like we talked about earlier, then that is also a very compelling business. And believe it or not, I would define businesses like that by identifying its overall business model. So my, when I refer to anti-fragility, I'm referring to the business model and how it can ensure that it will be successful. Okay. I can give some case examples. Do you have a, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. do you have a case example from Vietnam at yes, all? Yes, yes. Okay. There are actually many case examples in Vietnam. Let's talk about uh, Prudential for a second. If you know Prudential is a multinational business, they also have a business here in Vietnam. And what Prudential is, if you don't know, it's an insurance business. And how does the insurance business work? The insurance business works by collecting premiums. And what they do with that is basically they invest it on behalf of uh, all their clients and on behalf of the company as a, as a mechanism so that they can generate capital gains while some clients will actually have an actual emergency and actually need to utilize their insurance. So the whole model, the whole business model of insurance business is that they collect in, in layman's term is they collect a whole bunch of money. They're able to invest it. Very few people actually need insurance services. And the way that they mathematically calculate it with their models is that they're able to determine um, a certain ratio, for example, that they can accept to lose. And they know that a majority of that will be net profits for them. In finance terms, we call that a float. So basically a business that is able to collect money up front and be able to invest it in advance. So insurance is one example in, um, gyms, for example. Note, if you notice, they'll take maybe like a 18 month or like 12 month uh, membership from you. So they've just collected your money all up front, right? And so you're going to probably sign up for one year. They'll give you a great discount, but maybe several months from now, you're not even going to be using their gym services. Right. So what are they going to do with all that extra money? Well, maybe they can expand their businesses or they can return some of that to their investors. So there are certain businesses that have that inherent advantage and it strictly is dependent on the business model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so other than Prudential, is there a non insurance example? Like something like gyms, uh, obviously right. the pay up front. So that's just on float. Float. Is that the, the sole contributor to this anti-fragility that you're talking about? Or is there another example mm -hmm. that, that focuses on another part of that? Yeah. So basically, um, let's take something that many people could do, which is some kind of like licensing fee, for example, say you're, you have like a franchise or you're the owner of the franchise or you own the master franchise and you're able to uh, sublease your franchise so that someone else can use it maybe in Hanoi, for example. And you don't have to do any of the operating expenses for that, but you're collecting a royalty based on their revenue. These business models, irrespective of the changes in the macro economic environment, will still be impervious to that. And it's a very simple thing, but it's often not discussed about when you're discussing about such a tough frontier market like Vietnam. Okay. So about Phoenix Capital, what yeah. uh, what is your most popular, most commonly used product that you provide to people? The two most used products right now is our marketing services and our financial advisory services. Can you define each one of those a little bit more specifically? Sure, sure. So going back to the financial advisory is that, as I indicated, this conversation that we're having, believe it or not, there's going to be many people that want to set up businesses, start businesses, uh, figure out how to make them successful. Many of them are going to think, let's, let's take a bigger one, an SME and above. Like let's take a foreign listed company. Mm -hmm. They're not going to mess around by thinking, look, we can just do this willy nilly without planning. Um, and if they're willing to have the right advisors to structure some of this stuff for them, then they're going to be inherently at a much more advantageous position. Think about the content that we're talking about here and even apply that to a startup, for example. So if I was to create a brand new company, I think I could construct it in a manner that would allow it to be quote unquote anti-fragile. And many people here or in Southeast Asia might not see the value of that initially. But 
if you are a listed company or a small to medium enterprise, you probably would have the resources to say, hey, let's take a listen to what these Phoenix guys have to say. Um, they've obviously been here for a long time. They've created successful businesses. They've advised much bigger companies, even uh, multinational institutions. Perhaps we can benefit from something like that. And that's what we do in terms of our financial advisory business. Now, in terms of our digital marketing business is that there are many marketing agencies here in Vietnam. Very few are well-versed in terms of doing digital marketing. Let's take a look at the biggest industry in Vietnam, which is a real estate industry. Now, imagine if I was a company like Novaland, which probably is on the verge of IPOing, listing on the stock market, has a lot of projects aggressively building, trying to look for more tenants, more people to take out leases. And basically, they fully exhausted their offline approach. So we as an organization help companies like even Novaland to generate a successful digital campaign to basically bring online clients for an offline transaction. Because to purchase a house or a condo, it's going to be more than $300. And if you're spending more than $300 in Vietnam, you're going to need both an online component that creates a successful sales funnel to an offline component as well. So there's many industries that marketing guys are going to find very dry and they're not going to focus on them, such as financial services, real estate, insurance, all of these industries, pharmaceuticals, for example. But what is not understood is that these are probably some of the major pillars of the economy here. And if you can specialize in that, then you will have an inherent advantage. And that is the connection to the financial services aspect because we as an internet business have done successful copy in finance and now we're able to apply that for our clients in terms of marketing as well. Can you give us a, a specific example of a, a funnel that has done exactly what you just described? Okay. So in Vietnam, one of the bigger industries is uh, a sector called uh, consumer finance. Consumer finance is all the rage. Effectively, what it is, is basically I could go to a store and say I don't have enough money as long as I have proof of employment. I can go to one of these quote unquote consumer finance companies and basically take out a high interest loan in order to purchase my product. Typically, we're looking at maybe 30, 35% interest. Right. And there are consumers that are happy to buy that because they consider the, the value of the phone, for example, could be worth it and it could give them the social status that they need. So they'll buy the iPhone, pay 35% per annum uh, interest rate for that. And some company, which has a special license, uh, can provide them that loan. Now, it's a $15 billion industry and it's a rapidly growing industry. In Vietnam. In Vietnam. 15 billion. Correct. And it is continuing to grow um, and it's having a larger presence in all the major retailers here in Vietnam. So if you wanted to exploit uh, the quote-unquote consumer demographic, which everyone talks about notoriously, there are maybe ancillary ways to benefit from that, such as in financial services, such as in consumer finance. Now, there's very few companies that actually can obtain the license. You obviously have to have the relationships to do so. But what companies are successfully building the channel, the, the funnel, and who truly understands the copy, the, the whole approach to bringing a client online all the way to the point where they're walking in to your location and saying, hey, I want to open an account with you guys. And if you can master some of these niches, it can be extremely interesting. And those are some of the spaces that we're focused on. And maybe for any of the guys that are doing marketing that are listening to this, they're probably just like, I don't really know what this is. It makes no sense to me. I'd rather just sell uh, Coca-Cola. But good luck because um, companies like multinationals have only a select amount of agencies that they're going to go with. And you're going to have to bid for those projects. But those are probably the ones that are very competitive. Mm -hmm. And this is the blue oceans that I'm talking about as opposed to these red bloody waters. Right. So this, this consumer finance example, mm -hmm. uh, would you be working with the consumer finance companies or with the retailers? 
once again, oh. it offers many different permutations, right? Oh. You can um, provide value to many different perspectives. It's how you want to look at it and typically what kind of insight that you can provide. In fact, many of them are going to say, hey, we know some of this stuff that you're already talking about. But it's it, it's a matter of several things, the relationship, the, the quality of the pitch, and maybe the KPIs that you can deliver as well. Okay. All right. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit sure. here. Um, let's talk about some of the challenges you've had. Okay. What's been your most expensive mistake? Wow. This is an interesting question. Is the mistake spending all of this time building a fantastic economic moat in a country with a population of 90 million people or 93 million people with a GDP of basically 126 billion. Is that the most expensive mistake? Because you can, in theory, apply many of the things that we discussed about in much more developed markets and maybe be capturing a much larger sum of overall revenues. So the expensive mistake is perhaps the opportunity costs. With Phoenix Capital, we have a bunch of financial experts. Uh, some of them are foreign educated, but they've never had the opportunity to fully utilize their education about financial services or financial analysis because the market here is way too early stage for you to be talking about very complex aspects. And what happens for individuals that go to school internationally or domestically and they go through their university learning about all these different advanced financial products is that once they go into the job force, if they're not being able to practice and exercise their knowledge, then maybe they become a little bit more stale. So what we offer at this organization is that because we have a multinational client base, we're able to test the limits of your education and your background. And very few organizations can offer that. And if you're able to test someone's background, and you're probably one of the only shops in the house here in Vietnam that are doing something like this, then perhaps the opportunity is working internationally and being equally as viable as like a big four entity around the region. And that's the arbitrage. Okay. But how can you continue to develop and build that business? So we're at an interesting nexus right now where we have all this amazing infrastructure here in Vietnam. And some of the clients that we love to deal with are international clients because our work is internationally comparable. And as you know, it's probably very hard to maintain quality here. But what we're doing now is just outreaching towards maybe foreign direct investors, um, you know, investors that are interested in investing throughout the region, uh, that are looking for advisors, thinking about how they're going to grow their business, make it into a multinational business. And those are the things that we're able to do out of Vietnam, which is an interesting journey. And then sometimes you have to assess, once again, the opportunity costs that you uh -huh. took by spending time here. Uh -huh. But I think I compensate for that by still trying to contribute things internationally. As you know, we have this podcast, the Big Trade Series. We talk to Nobel Prize winners. We talk to world-renowned investors and, you know, presidential candidates like Ron Paul. So it's it's an interesting journey, but you have to find your niche. Okay. And, well, there's two things I want to talk about here, and they're both mm -hmm. equally as interesting to me. Mm -hmm. First of all, you, you just talked about the opportunity cost of being in Vietnam directly after saying niching down into specific parts for your services right. is how you have an advantage. Right. Perhaps niching into Vietnam is one of those advantages. I guess the other question then is when, right? Because you said the opportunity cost is how much time you spend here in order to realize that opportunity. Right. Right. Um, the second thing about the podcast, since you brought it up, where did the podcast come from? Because it's called The the Big Trade, right? Right. Uh, which is also the title of a book you wrote. Correct. So tell us about that. Okay. So... Going back to your first question is the when, right? And I think in order to manage my sanity is that's why we have to find like the niches ASAP mm -hmm. and try to implement them. Some of it may be a little early as far as market development is concerned. Some of it's just the perfect time right now. But as I said, when you're trying to build an anti-fragile business, you cannot in this country, especially use the word when 
You cannot be dependent on certain catalysts to happen because that could take forever. So you've got to make sure whatever it is that you're applying is applicable now. Because at the end of the day, you have to put food on the table. You have to generate revenue. I look at my P&L, say, for example, on a monthly basis. So we got to make sure that these ideas, which might sound conceptual right now or might sound theoretical, have that applicable um, application from a commercial respect. And that's what we've been doing. As far as the content is concerned, we believe that's also a major competitive advantage because how many people, as you mentioned, are doing podcasts? How many people are doing books? How many people are even thought leaders out of Vietnam from an international perspective? So what we offer to clients is, once again, something that is internationally comparable from a thought leaders, from a, a think tank, basically, that's doing some interesting R&D relatively innovative, but also pragmatic to the current conditions of the market, um, that's a very rare composition. And not only are we just doing this for the sake of doing it, because anyone can self-publish a book, as you know, many people can do a podcast, but we try, or at least we strive to make sure that it's internationally comparable. So this book that's published by Wiley was published internationally. Then it got published in Vietnam. It sold about 5,000 copies internationally, translated by the University of Shanghai Finance and Economics. It was like a top seller on Amazon. It covers the quantitative approaches to, to building models. And the podcast has, like I mentioned, reputable people such as Nobel Prize winners, renowned investors like Jim Rogers, Doug Casey, uh, renowned newsletter writers like Porter Stansberry, Ron Paul, a libertarian thought leader um, on, on the podcast as well. And then sometimes really quirky guys that have really interesting insight. That is probably another way to keep sanity, but also to make sure that we are contributing and you don't just get stuck in the nexus of Vietnam. Okay. That, I mean, we could talk about these things, I think, all day long. Yeah. Um, these are topics that are really interesting to me. Right. Um, especially since the, the quantitative angles that you take on services here in Vietnam is, right. is really, really unique, I believe, and worth exploring. Um, but the podcast is a limited time. So we're going to round out this episode by sure. focusing more in on you uh, okay. personally. Right. Okay. What inspires you? Because you do a lot of things. Right. Um, when you talk about your, your models, at the, you come alive and, and talk about this and that and the other yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of things that come together. Right. But what inspires you to take this difficult journey of being here in Vietnam, doing something unique? I have a wild imagination. And it is one of man's great successes to take your thoughts and ideas and transform the world around you and then have the world around you transform you through some fantastic feedback loop. A, jet, a strategist named John Boyd, he has a, a strategy, a military strategy called OODA loop, which is observe and orient and ultimately then decide and take action. And what I've seen in Vietnam was when I came here, I just worked at banking institutions and I've managed to transform myself and transform my own environment, my whole world through these ideas and hard work. And what allows you to do that is to basically try to tap into your maximum potential. Probably one of the things that inspires me, which is to become basically the best version of myself as possible. And there's no limit to that. And every day that you practice your craft and hone into that, you're just becoming better and more better than the competition. And that proves itself, obviously, through the growth and the success of your business. Because that's another feedback loop that you're getting too. So I could be a complete heretic saying all this stuff, but I know that, you know, we have clients. Our clients are satisfied. We're making revenue from this. We're a profitable business. Mm -hmm. So that's some feedback loop. 
but you constantly have to improve. And, and that's, that's what inspires me to be the best person that I possibly can be. And what was interesting was when I was in Canada, um, you're a minority. So I'm Canadian Vietnamese, basically, right? And people, uh, the financial industry there is very Anglo-Saxon based as well. So most of the, the people in top of this, uh, the industry are like that. And there's basically, uh, glass ceilings. But, you know, spending all this time and focus on being the best version of yourself, you've effectively broken glass ceilings. And what's interesting is that because you're, you become a better person, even the perception that other people have of you is completely different. So if you were talking to me maybe 15 years ago, you're like, who is this guy? Right. And I think that's, that's the message. But for some reason, not a lot of people have that goal and not a lot of people are on that path for whatever reason. And it affects their whole life because let's say I'm only interested in finding a lover, for example. And if I don't, if I haven't self-actualized, then the, my relationship with other people is going to be very different. So there, there's something quite interesting to say, Hey, what if we could try to be the best person that we can be? What, how would the world treat us? And I've seen that feedback loop and it's, it's fantastic. And if other people were on that path, we could create some really amazing things. Okay. Wow. That, that's a lot of inspiration. And mm. uh, I think you skipped right into my, my question about advice. Okay. I think that's all wrapped up into that answer right there. I think that's really great. Um, I feel a, a lot of similar things about being the best version of myself. Mm. Uh, so we're in, we're in line there. So instead of asking about more advice, yeah. I'm going to ask you to give our audience three action points for business in Vietnam in 2017. Okay. That's interesting. Just three points. Okay. Read the four hour work week. Just name all of Tim Ferriss's books, you know, the, no, 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 chef, no, no. the tools of no, time. No, no. There you go. Wait, you so them. read the four hour work week. Read the 48 laws of power and read smart cuts. Smart cuts. Yeah. Okay. Your action points for better business is to read. Read a heck of a lot. Read a heck of a lot. Yeah. I can't argue with that advice. Uh, that, that's, those are good action points for everyone. I'm going to put all three of those into the, the show notes for right. sure. Um, can you share with the audience where we can get in touch with you? Yeah, you can reach us at info at phx-cap.com. Okay. That's the Phoenix Capital site. Okay. Uh, any social media? Uh, LinkedIn. You can probably find me there, but you're probably better off like hearing from me first before you even want to talk to me at the podcast, which is the Big Trade Series. Or you could read my book, which is, well, that's another one you should read. <laughs> um, the Big... The Big Trade, Simple Strategies for Maximum Market Returns. Okay. That's, that's uh, action point number four. Perhaps. <laughs> without being self-promotional. But at least you get a, you get a sense. And, and I think there's, there's some philosophical approaches. People just think it's, oh, it's stock market stuff. But no, there's more to that. There's a story behind it. And, and once again, if you think about the end and you think about the beginning and how you get there, it can be quite interesting. Okay. That's a great point on ending it. Speaking yeah. of end games. Uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing your vision, your inspiration about Phoenix Capital and everything right. else. We'll be listening to you uh, and hopefully some people will be listening to us. So thank you once again and have a happy new year. You are the first episode of 2017. Thank you very much, Brian. It's good to talk to you. <laughs>